Hi everyone. Welcome to one of the fun events of our children's summer reading final party of 2020. Um, I'm here with Mr. Jim from Nature Discovery and he is going to teach us all about turtles today. Welcome Mr. Jim. All right, thank you, Crystal. And uh, I should mention, not just any old turtles, these are Michigan turtles. And so some, uh, some audience members might have seen the, the title for it is something like, hey, meet the Grand Slam of Michigan turtles. So there's 10 species of turtles native to the state of Michigan. And here at our little private nature center, we're taking care of all 10 of them. And we go out around the state, before all this happened, uh, you know, giving presentations, setting them up, up at exhibits, at sometimes libraries, and at other outdoorsy, naturey events, things like that. So you're today going to be able to meet all 10 species native to Michigan. Now I have a DNR poster back here that is showing all 10. Now that's the latest version of the DNR poster, but here is an older one. Um, they are actually working on their third version of the Turtles of Michigan. And here's the poster. I'll back that up far enough for you to see everybody. Yeah. There's all 10 species that you're going to meet in the flesh, in the shell, uh, over the course of our time together. You're going to learn how to identify them, what part of the state you might might find that kind of turtle. All of these just don't live in any pond in any part of the state necessarily. And learn some things about them, how they live their lives, what makes them special, the way they behave, as well as we're going to be talking quite a bit about this, things related to people being out and around doing their people things everywhere that are making it hard for these to survive. I think everybody needs to know this if we want to continue to have turtles in the world with us, around us. So uh, how I would like to get started is letting you know that Turtles are classified scientifically, a lot of people have learned this before, classified scientifically into, you know, a certain group of reptiles. So a turtle is a reptile, type of reptile. So it belongs to this order of reptiles called testudines, which is turtles and tortoises. We've got a couple of tortoises too, by the way, but they're not, not Michigan. And then within the order of reptiles that is the turtles, there are a bunch of different families of turtles. And there are species in each of these families of turtles. Now here in Michigan, Michigan has, these 10 species here, Michigan has four families represented, four turtle families by these 10 species. But I find this very, very, very interesting the way it breaks down, okay, how many species are in each one of these families. Here's the way it breaks down. There's one family that has just one Michigan species in it. There's a second family that has one Michigan species in it. There's a third family that has one Michigan species in it. And then the fourth family, you might do your mental math, and come up with seven, then there's one family that has, ba-boom, seven species of turtles in it. So seven, one, one, one. Now, if you were ever looking at a bunch of different turtles of different species, you know, all randomly around in front of you, and you are wondering to yourself, hmm, I wonder if these turtles, some of these might be in different family than the others. If you look at the way they're built, you might be able to notice right away, whoa, this turtle looks different enough the way it's built than anybody else. It's a weird looking turtle. You might find yourself saying, wow, that's a weird looking turtle. It's probably one of these sitting in its own family. So the, one, the family that has seven in it, this one, the most familiar turtle in Michigan sits in it. And I think a lot of people might know what that is. It's the most familiar turtle that the most people know. All right, I know some of you are saying it. Painted! Painted turtle. <laughs> so the painted turtle is, you know what, you look at that. And I think 
a lot of you would agree, it just looks like a regular turtle. So there is this big family of turtles. The family scientific name is called Emidae, and they call that the pond turtles. And we have seven species that look kind of generally like this. Their coloration might be different. There might be some little slight differences the way their shells are or colors or spots or, or, or stripes. Uh, but that's the big family represented by the painted turtle and six others, okay? Uh, the tip, you know, you might call them the typical turtles, okay? Then, for example, <laughs> look at this bizarre one. I should move this over this way. Every time I lean for a turtle, you get to see my face really close. Let's get this flow closer to me. All right. Look at this weird one. Wow, does that look different than the painted? Some of you might know. And a lot of kids call this the pancake turtle. It's called a spiny soft shell, eastern spiny soft soft shell. This one is not liking being held. None of them like being held. They wish you'd put them down. But the uh, soft shell, wow. You can tell this is one of them that's just sitting in its own family, you know, uh, all by itself. There, in fact, is a family of turtles called the soft shell turtles. And we might have, I'm not sure exactly, we might have like four or five species of soft shell turtles across the country. Just the one eastern spiny soft shell in Michigan. So here comes another one that's sitting in its own family. This is the snapping turtle. So look at this. Snapping turtle looks very, almost like dinosaur-like, you know, it looks primitive. Uh, it's, it's got a rugged shell. This is a good way to identify snapping turtles too. It's got this jagged, back edge of the shell, if you can make that out at all with back edge, sawtooth, back edge of the shell, that's a very good field mark for the, the um, snapping turtle. And look at that tail, it has these little plates, spikes sticking up on it that almost reminds me of the tails of certain, uh oh, dinosaurs, it's actually starting to drip, it's not liking me touching that. Okay. Boy, you can tell it's not having fun. Wants me to put it down. Throw the soft shell turtle. Here's the third one. It might be a little bit harder to tell from the others, but once I point out some features, you'll, you'll get it. Look at how this one, how elongated its shell is. It has a very long shell. It, it makes its shell kind of look more egg-like, doesn't it? It almost looks like an egg. In fact, that would be a cool name, alternate name for this eggshell turtle. This is actually called the common um, musk turtle. Another name for it, by the way, is stink pot. Stink pot. Uh, because wild ones, when you pick them up often, they don't like to be picked up. There are these scent glands that open up and they really stink. You know, and you're like, ew, what's that smell when you pick it up? So they get the name stink pot. Uh, just a little funny side note, sometimes when we were running, when we could run kids' nature day camps out here, uh, the first day we would have the kids in the camp, everybody gives themselves a nature name for everybody to call them through the week. This is your nature name. And every now and then there are some kids who are like, I'm not sure what nature name I want. And I said, well, if you can't come up with one, I... I've got all kinds of funny nature names, and I'm just going to assign you a funny nature name, like Stinkpot. <laughs> LW Stinkpot. <laughs> all right, so that, that's, uh, that's the musk turtle. It's the smallest turtle in Michigan, but it has that really elongated shell compared to the others, and I find that that really stands out to me. It's also very high domed when you look at it on the side. So you just met those three that are sitting in their own families. And just really quickly, I'll, um, uh, Crystal, I'll go ahead and show my those all together going across the screen with the name of their families, scientific name of their families above that. So I'm gonna go uh, hopefully quickly here to the screen share to show you. There it is, and everybody gets a good look at that. So 
look at that. You see, <clears throat> oh, by the way, every turtle you just saw uh, live is in this picture. <laughs> uh, the actual turtles you just saw. So all the way on your right, you see the painted turtle that's sitting in that family Emi today. Uh, it has seven species. Chelydridae is the snapping turtles. There's only two species in the whole country in Chelydridae. There's an alligator snapping turtle down south that some people may have heard of before. And then there's the musk turtle uh, next in line. There's that family Kinosternidae is the musk and mud turtles. And then Trionicidae is the softshell turtle family that we talked about. So I will get off of that now. All right. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I'm not going to necessarily take these family by family. I want to start out with this. I'll be in front of an audience on the topic of turtles, and I'll say, even though we have 10 species of turtles in Michigan, I rarely, rarely meet somebody who can just, if asked, rattle off all 10 species, painted turtle, snapping turtle, musk turtle, softshell turtle, man, you know, map turtle, blamey's turtle, and so on. I rarely, rarely meet somebody who can do that. So people need to learn their Michigan turtles. If these things are going to survive, you have to be aware that they're out there and what kind of habitat they live in, okay? Uh, are or as questions. So Dorothy, oh, we've answered your okay. question about how many species of turtle are native to Michigan. 10. I now know that. Um, so, uh, so you know that they can't rattle them off and then you were going to say something else. Okay, good. So, uh, what I do mention to the audience is, is from my experience going around and we've been doing this a lot of years, it seems like everybody knows two species of turtles that live in Michigan because from their experience, these are the ones they see and notice and talk about the most. You all at home or wherever you're watching this might be saying what those turtles are. Well, you're right. One of them is the painted. Yeah. There is a reason, there is definitely a reason why everybody knows these two turtles and they're maybe not as familiar with so many of the others. You might know one or two or three others that, that you may have seen before or heard people talking about before. Okay, here's why. These two turtles, the painted and snapping, are everywhere <laughs> in Michigan. There are only two species of turtles out of the ten in the state of Michigan that you can find in every county of the state. Uh, this one's not having fun, I'm gonna put it down. This one's more relaxed. Every county of the state, even in the Upper Peninsula, and it's painted turtle and it's snapping turtle. So that explains it partly, you know, wherever we go, painted turtle, snapping turtle. Uh, and then um, here's something else. A lot of people are under the impression, hey, the turtle lives in the pond. It's not that simple. There's a lot of different types of wetlands out there, and there are certain species of turtles that can only make it for a long period of time in a certain type of wetland, okay? So the painted and the snapping turtle are not picky. If there is water, there are painted turtles. If there is water, there are snapping turtles. Big deep lake, yes. Tiny little pond, yes. Uh, big white river, yes. Tiny trickling stream, yes. Ditch on the side of the road, of a country road, filled with water, painted or snapping turtles show up after a while. They, they are not picky. This is why there's so many of them out there. Any habitat, aquatic habitat will do. All right, I'm getting my unstable signal, but hopefully we work through that. Okay, all right, so uh, all the rest of them are found in a more limited part of the state, not across the state, and most of them too require a certain type of wetland that we're going to talk about. So this is way more complicated than the turtle lives in the pond, the turtle lives in its shell, whatever. But hey, while I've got the painted turtle out. Let's just get some little bits of terminology down pat. We're going to be talking about turtle physiology and turtle behavior as we're going through um, these different 
um, turtle species. But anyway, just so you know what we're talking about here when I throw that term out, the top part of a turtle shell is called the carapace, C-A-R-A-P-A-C-E. Some people pronounce it carapace. The bottom part, flat part of a turtle shell is called the plastron, P -A L A S T R O N. Okay. Um, turtles have lungs. They do not have gills, they have lungs, and therefore, if they're swimming around in the water, they need to come up regularly to get a breath of air. Turtles do have a tail. And here's something we can get into at some point uh, during our time together today. It is very weird, but a turtle, its rear end, its opening for the droppings to come out is on its tail. You don't find animals. I, I can't off the top of my head think of any other animal whose who's opening for droppings to come out is on its tail. Think of your household pets, you know, your, your cat, your dog, your bird, whatever. The tail is there sticking out from the body. So in that respect, for a turtle, you can think of the turtle's tail as being a part of its body that is sticking out behind it. That is part of its body, and that is why. If you cut off a cat's tail, it's going to hurt the cat. Meow! But the cat's going to survive. And a little stump, stump's going to heal over and the cat would be just fine. You know, same with, the, you know, a dog or any other animal. You cut a turtle's tail off, you're going to kill the turtle. You just cut off a critical part of its body. Okay. So, uh, you know, wow. There's stuff you're learning about turtles already. Very uniquely built creatures. Um, and to help them, you know, this is what works for them in their environment, their habitat. Okay, so um, let's, well, let's start with this. I'm going to give you some specific, a little few more you know, specific things about uh, painted turtles, and we'll start to go through all of the different species. So the painted turtle gets its name because, do you see around the rim of, of the underside of its uh, carapace here, you see all those dabs of red or orange? Now, I'll tell you, with a wild one, those color, that color will be a lot brighter than it is here. So I just want to mention here with all of our turtles, the coloration that's going to be on a wild one. When you keep turtles in captivity over time, their color fades a little bit. They are just not as bright. It might be a little bit of some nutrient deficiency, but it happens across the board. People who are keeping turtles in captivity they tend to their colors fade. So you're going to see brighter turtles outside, but I'm going to point out those colors. That is a terrific field mark for the painted turtle. It is the only Michigan turtle. You're going to hear me say this a few times. It is the only Michigan turtle with little dabs of red or orange all around the rim of the shell. From on the top, you can see the little dabs on the edge of a little bit. You can see it better on the side. You can see it, really see it well on the bottom, but out in nature, unless you can get the turtle in your hand, you typically don't see them looking like this. <laughs> you know, you see them this way, and then you're going to know. And also, commonality, painted turtles are everywhere. Snapping turtles are everywhere. When you're outside, from a distance, you see a turtle, you should be thinking right away, is it a painted, is it a snapping, until you can prove to yourself it's one of these less common ones. Okay, And then you see it has all of those broad, broad uh, stripes around the face, and it has some orangey stripes on its legs and even into its, under, into its, the, the gap between its shells, um, upper and lower a little bit, okay? So this is a young painted. Um, many people ask how old does a turtle live? Uh, th this one is like two years old, but uh, you know, you can get painted turtles going up to 25, 30 something years or so, which seems, you know, for for little turtle. You know, some species of turtles that can get up closer to 100 years old uh, as well. So the least, uh, the shortest line of Michigan turtles are, you know, like right around there, 25, 30 years. That, 
that is the, the the shortest live ones. So when we got the Grand Slam of Michigan Turtles, when we were able to acquire all 10 of them, we're going to have this for a long time. We got the Grand Slam in 2010, and we've had it for 10 years now because these turtles live a long time. So we've got it, you know, and keep them healthy, and, and we're all good there. Okay, the, so I here's the same. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is the, the, the markings on the painted turtle, those colors, um, do they serve a purpose in the wild or are they just just an identification piece? You know, uh, I, I think with adaptations, including physical adaptations, including the coloration of something, boy, evolutionarily, you know, how these these things um, evolve and develop over time. There's, there's advantages to just about everything you see the way an animal is built, including colors and coloration. And we can go ahead and study that turtle, the painted turtle, and try to take a guess, maybe an educated guess, the more you learn about the turtle and what advantage it has to be in that color. Now, here's something generally, so I don't know if I can say why, you know, what purpose do all those little orangey dots around the rim hold, but one thing might be true with it because each of these has its own spots and stripes and colors is these things are going to help them visually no, oh, you're one of my kind. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna it's gonna help them recognize each other that hey, you're my species because you you are generally not going to get a, a turtle of one species coming together and mating with another one and having this weird hybrid. You know that's not going to happen. So they have to identify their kind outside. So anyway, that's a start to answer your question. Uh, um, kind of a weak answer, but hey. This is the world of science. It's all about asking questions and then trying to figure out the answers. This is science. And for any kids out there, even adults, if you have an inquiring mind, you're looking at something, huh, I wonder why this is. And then you try to figure out, maybe through experimentation, different uh, trials and whatnot, try to find that answer. Science is, you know, is an activity or profession or whatever of questions and seeking answers. And you know what? Sometimes it's hard to get those answers. <laughs> you know, you can, you can spend your whole life trying to find the answers to it. And that's, you know, one of the, I think, one of the draws for me to the world of science and says, wow, so many questions I want to know. And if you have a curious mind, call yourself, I have a scientific mind. If you have a curious mind, you, you could be a good scientist, okay? And you want to know, I want to know, and then you, you study it. Okay, so getting back to the snapping turtle, I tell people I am disappointed that this poor turtle got the name snapping because it makes people think bad things about it. Oh, snapping turtles. So, you know, people come over here and we have our turtles swimming around in all together in the pool outside. Mm -hmm. And some, they'll look at them and And when we point out the snapping turtle, a parent might say to a child, whoa, watch out for that one. You know, and you know, it's little like this. It's little like some of these other turtles. And we tell them, right away a snapping turtle is no meaner or um when it's little more dangerous than or anything than any other turtle and it, it doesn't have a mean disposition or nasty or anything it got a bum rap by somebody giving it the name snapping turtle i think the snapping turtle got the name snapping because of this here and there i'll keep picking it up and showing you things but this turtle is so unhappy being held i'm gonna put it down and keep putting it down and picking it up again but um i watched the snapping turtle feeding in the pool and you drop these turtle food sticks onto the water and they're floating on the water and here's the pretend my fist is the snapping turtle's head here's the food floating here the snapping turtle 
always does this. Here's the food. It slowly comes up to the food. And there's suddenly it noses up to it. Then like that. You know what? You don't see a snapping turtle just slowly go up and go like this at anything. It noses up to it. It does that with any of its food. It's just the way it approaches its food. It gives that quick little snap when its head gets close. Now you watch the painted turtles and some of these other turtles swimming around and food sticks are floating on the top of the water, just munch, munch, swimming around, munch, 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 you know, cleaning it up and the snapping turtle is doing its slow motion thing, you know, like that. All right, so think of that for how the snapping turtle has its name, not like, oh, it's going to snap me. We don't find that the snapping turtle acts any more defenses or scared or ready to bite you than any of the other turtles. Uh, so I think that's good to good for everybody to know, kind of an attitude adjustment about this turtle. Okay, so I told you before, we are talking about the turtle families, good field marks. The uh, sawtooth edge on the back of the shell, no other Michigan turtle has it. I told you, you're going to hear me say that a few times. No other Michigan turtle has these spines like little bumps sticking up on the tail of a very long tail. Snapping turtle for the length of its body also has the, the longest tail for the length of its body or its size, its shell size. So that's good to know. Okay. Uh, so snapping turtles in the shell. It does, doesn't it? And so, you know what, um, you can look back, and I know there are a lot of kids out there who are interested in, you know, dinosaur life and primitive life before people were around on planet Earth. And if you um, Google images, let's say, uh, primitive turtle, you go ahead and Google image that, you're going to see some old fossil, fossil, remains that have been found of some turtles that they'll go ahead this is how we know you know we have an idea what what different dinosaurs look like because they find the bone structure and some artist tries to you know put the fill in the pieces there on what it would look like on the outside when they do that with these primitive turtle fossils that go back you know a, a couple of hundred million years they look, the, the snapping turtle looks more like them than any, you know, than, than that rendition than any of the other Michigan turtles. So I have a feeling it is a primitive family of turtles, you know, like maybe one of the precursors to our more modern looking turtles. Okay. So Michigan's largest turtle, you know, they can live up over 50 years and often do, but it's just good for everybody to know, little baby. Turtles, when they just first hatch out of egg, they have a super high mortality rate. Immortality means they just die in great numbers. Uh, mortality rate, a high mortality rate means they die in great numbers at that size. So most little hatchling turtles, when they come out of an egg, their chances of making it to their first birthday are like two in a hundred. You know, it is really, really low, really low. Uh, so when you see a snapping turtle that might be as big as the one we have, that one made it, it made it, it made it past its first birthday. And the bigger uh, um, a snapping turtle or any other turtle gets, the better its odds are to live a long life. As long as the people reasons don't get in the way, like as long as it doesn't get hit by a car, you know, but as far as dangers in the natural world go to it the bigger it gets the more they go down but then there's the people factor and cars are a big one you know uh, okay so that's the snapping turtle by the way there's so much more to learn about these i tell people these could be classes in school just turtle class it goes on for like six weeks you know you get turtle or longer you know you get lessons about michigan turtles once or twice a week there's not much to to learn about them. And so there are things I have in my head. Like, okay, we'll keep this under two hours. I wish I could share with you, but hey, this isn't a whole class. Okay, so uh, that's where people might have questions. They might have a question for me about snapping turtles that I didn't get to with our spending a few minutes on it and hey, fire away. You know, we'd like to, we'd like to get those. Uh, okay, so let's move on with some others. The next one I want to show you is this one. This is a little one that's less than a year old. 
This is called the red-eared slider. Oh, yeah, I can see that. Okay. And you see that orange, orangey, red, red, orange stripe out behind the eye. Uh, and just to let you know that that is not its ear. Uh, so this is another one that was misnamed. It just looks like a place where an ear should be behind the eye. And there you go, it's little legs. It's not happy being held. But uh, uh, the red-eared slider, um, you know, if you want to name it for that, probably should have just been called the red-striped or red-browed <laughs> slider or something like that. So turtles, just to let you know, since we're on that, I'm going to hold it really close. You do not see it. Turtles can hear, but you do not see an ear opening on that, uh, on the side of its head. And so, like a frog... I think everybody's seen frogs enough that you know it's got this round spot behind its eye on its head. That is its hearing apparatus. It's a little bit different than ours. It's called a tympanum. And that tympanum vibrates when sound waves hit it. And, that, you know, it, it, and that's how it hears. It's more of an external thing. But there's no hole going into a frog's head. This tympanum is it. You know, it's vibrating tympanum when sound waves hit it. It is exactly the same for turtles. Turtles have a tympanum too, but it's easy to see the tympanum behind the eye of a frog because on just about every species, there is color, like on a bullseye, there is a color going around it, there is a ring going around it that makes that thing stand out on its head. Most of our turtles have lines like this one. One lines running through the side of their head, and they are not interrupted where they go around the tympanum. They run right through it. Wow. And because of that, and there's no rim of skin sticking up around their tympanum or anything, if you look at a bigger turtle, really tough to see on a tiny one like this, but you look at a bigger turtle in a certain light, bright light, at different angles on the side, you can make out this little round kind of flattened spot on the side of its head, usually behind and a little bit below its eye, and you can make out the tympanum, and there's little, like on the slider, little yellow lines running through it. Um, so that's, you know, that's the way they hear. Now look at this. This one has a bit of a ridge running up the middle of the shell. See that? It's not nice and smooth across the back. So that's a nice little feel mark. You see how greenish this one's uh, carapace looks? Yeah, that green to fade towards brown. In fact, I'm going to tell you, I got this one as a little hatchling. It was boy, about a quarter of the size. It's grown that much in about nine months. Uh, or 10 months now, I guess. But this little turtle is not as bright as it was when it hatched. In a year from now, this thing should be brown looking. Now they start to go towards brown. Uh, okay, so, oh, and look at this. It has very spotty plastron. Now the jury is out, whoa. Jury is out, almost dropped it. Uh, the jury is out on whether the red-eared slider is actually a native Michigan turtle. They have been around in Michigan, uh, only in the lower part of the state, by the way, in waterways, rivers, you know, some lakes and ponds. But the reason scientists who study turtles aren't absolutely positive that this turtle is actually native to Michigan is these are very common down south of Michigan. Lakes, rivers, a very common turtle. You know, you might call it the painted turtle of the southern states. It is okay. really, really common down there. But the northern limits of its range, just continuous range, just touched the bottom of the Great Lakes, just the very bottom of Lake Michigan, Lake Erie, and it stops right there. But then you go up into Michigan, and there are little spots of red-eared slider populations. And you know where, where most of these spots are? There's a spot around the greater Grand Rapids area, the greater Lansing area, the greater Detroit area, the greater Flint area. Why is it that there are these scattered spots across lower Michigan and they tend to be in areas where there are cities? Well, this turtle for decades has been the most commonly sold Anybody see where this is going? Uh, so people who are, you know, who buy one from a pet store, they decide, oh, you know, they're tired of keeping it or whatever. 
or they want to give it its freedom get in the pond down the street or the river. And there's enough people that have done that, that all of a sudden two red-eared sliders are finding each other, a male and a female and mating, and she's laying eggs. And all of a sudden, hey, you're getting a little population building up there. They're able to make it. Um, our warming climate is only going to benefit them if it's a southern turtle. Hey, it's, you know, it's getting milder and warmer summers and milder winters through Michigan, which is making it easier for them to survive and their populations expand, you know, because of that. So red eared slider, common pet store turtle. Okay. Um, we actually had a question about red eared slider from one of our patrons. So is this a good time to ask yes, it? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So on Instagram, one of our followers, Sam Ann Elizabeth, asked, I have a red eared slider who seems likely she's about to lay her first eggs. Any advice for getting her to be comfortable in a nesting area? When it's time for her to lay her eggs, and if she's got any kind of loose soil around that she can find, she's just going to start digging. As far as that comfortability goes, um, you know what? She wants to lay those eggs, and she's not just going to keep holding them in, especially if she's not afraid of you. You know, she's a pet. She's not afraid of you. She wants to get those eggs out. Uh, but, you know, my first question you know, uh, to these folks would be, all of this is moot if, if you don't have a male turtle, right? I mean, she's not going to lay eggs that are going to be viable anyway, you know, if you don't have a male that you know she mated with, okay? So in that case, it doesn't really matter where she lays her eggs. We have had turtles um, many times over the years. We've been doing this over 30 years that we didn't, well, weren't quite aware or ready for the fact that it might be laying eggs. Plus, we're, we're, we don't see males mating with females in, in captivity here. So we know that any female who's laying eggs, and if she can't hold them back and she's laying them in the pool, in the water, because we just have a pool of water with some rocks stacked up underneath a lamp for them to warm themselves up and they pile up on the rocks. So there's no dirt to dig in and um but we've had female turtles lay eggs in the water before then you know the the egg just comes out because they have nowhere to dig a hole and we'll have sometimes the other turtles go after them but we're not upset about it because we know she never made it like, you know nothing's going to hatch out of those eggs anyway but i would say just give her i've done this before with one female turtle years ago all i did was put her now she was a small species i put her in a tray maybe twice as wide as this i started going like this and noticed oh you can't see my hands apart so twice as wide as this but she was a species she's a turtle this big and i put her in there and she crawled around crawled around and i walked away and left her in there for hours in fact i think i left her overnight and it was a tray that had some, I just threw some mulch in there, some really finely ground mulch about this deep in there. And it, uh, the next day, I started sifting my fingers through the loose mulch and I was popping up eggs. So at some point when we weren't around, she dug that hole and dropped the eggs in there and then kept crawling around. So, okay. Okay, so uh, hopefully that's, you know, we're, we're good there answering that question. So, uh, yeah, watch for, watch for red-eared sliders uh, mixed in on some pond or, you know, length of a river or something if you're in the lower part of Michigan and, you know, Farmington area, boy, with all the people around, you go to a park, it would not surprise me at all if you saw a red eared slider or two in a, a, you know, a pond in a park or a length of, you know, river nearby at all, sunning itself. Okay, so we will continue. We, we've covered three species so far. Um, the next one I'd like to cover is this one that also has a ridge on its shell, um, plastron, or I mean, uh, carapace, sorry. Just paint, seeing if you're paying attention. Uh, look at this. This is called a common map turtle. Look, that one has a strong ridge on its shell, too. See that? Running right up the middle. Kind of looks like a mountain chain. Okay. All the rest of the turtles we're covering, you know, none of them have 
a, a ridge sticking up like that, like this one in the red air slider. This has the strongest ridge of all of them. So I want to show you this. This is uh, a river specialist turtle. I'll occasionally see a map turtle on a lake or a pond, but you know what, I, in just about every case I notice, that lake or pond is really close to a river. And so it's this river turtle that's really good at dealing with currents. It's a very strong swimming turtle. Look at the wide paddle-like back legs for pushing water. So very strong muscles with this really extra wide foot for pushing water like a flipper, okay? Uh, a couple of other things I wanna point out for identifying this. It gets the name map turtle, I believe, because of all these little squiggles. If you look up close, there are little faint squiggles of you know, like yellow on its shell. Uh, can, I think maybe I have yes. it close enough you can see those. Yes. That reminded somebody however long ago that this got its common name um, of, you know, like lines on a map or something. And then here's another good, that is not a good field mark, by the way. You know, look how close I had to get it. You know, when we're talking about a field mark, you're looking at a turtle, maybe you have binoculars away from you, you know, out on a log. You're not going to get a wild one this close unless, you know, you get it in your hands. It's out of the water, maybe something like that. Okay, here's a very good field mark, though. Look at its pale lips. Oh. It almost looks like it has yellowy lipstick, doesn't it? Look, I back it all the way up to here and you can still see that sticking out, those lips sticking out. If any of you go ca kayaking or canoeing on a river, this is by far in the lower part of the state. I'm going to say the bottom half is, of the lower peninsula. This is by far, it's not close, by far the most common turtle on rivers in the lower half of the state. So expect to see them. If you see a turtle up on a log, expect it to be a map turtle until you can prove to yourself otherwise. And females of a lot of these get big. I didn't mention this with the red-eared slider. Red-eared slider, female, she'll get like 10, 10, 11 inches on the shell. And the male might only get six inches, five, six inches length on the shell. In most of our species of turtle, the female gets substantially larger than the male. So some people ask, how do you tell a male from a female turtle? With most species, if it's an adult, you just look at the size and you know if it's an adult. Little turtles, you know, you gotta go by something else, you know, if they're little baby ones. Okay, so this one here, um, I'm thinking this one is a female, it's young. But the map turtle females get big. You can see them out there on the river. They're like 10, 12 inches on the shell. They are good size. Males, not much bigger than this one. And this one is only about eh, three and a half inches on the shell. A male doesn't get more than about four. I don't know if I've ever seen one that was even five inches on the shell. They're half the size of the females. So you know what? Well, a lot of people who don't know their turtles, they look out on a log sticking up out of the water on a river and they see big turtle, big turtle, little turtle, little turtle, little turtle, you know, and they're inclined to say, oh, look, there's mommy and daddy and their three babies. Doesn't work that way with turtles. It's two big humongous females with three males behind them, you know, on, on the log. They could be young ones. Naturally, there are, there are young, turtles out there, but they're either young or they're males. They are definitely not adult females. You can uh, eliminate that one. I love the pinstripes of yellow oh, yeah. on its neck and head. And look at this one. I hold it this way. It has a yellow spot behind each eye. Oh, yeah. These specialized in a river are known to be specialists on snails. Really strong jaws, and they can crunch right through the shell of any snail they find in a river, spit out the bits and just eat the, you know, the soft body of the snail inside of the shell. We are doing this all the time in our pool of a uh, community pool of different species of turtles. And we'll drop some snails in there. Turtles will eat anything. We didn't talk about what turtles are eating in a pond. Highly omnivorous. Plant, animal matter, dead or alive. You know what? If it's organic, they'll try it. They might decide they like something more than something else, but they play the role of predators. 
herbivores, so carnivores, herbivores, predators, and scavengers. They're doing it all. Plant animal matter. They're kind of like the cleanup crew of a pond, you know, vertebrate cleanup crew in a big way. But you know what? We drop. We'll go in a pond and scoop up with, with nets a bunch of various sized snails and drop them into that, that water. And all of the turtles see these snails there. If it's anything new, they're coming up, putting their noses up to it. Hey, can I eat this? And they're going to try to eat it. And we watch the painted turtle and the red-eared slider, a couple other turtles grabbing the shells and they're trying, they know that there's some food in there, trying and trying, and they might eventually start to get that shell apart. But they're not very efficient at it. It takes them a long time and they'll be diligent working at it. You watch these map turtles going up to them, crunch, 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 spit, spit, all the little bits of shell coming out and down grabbing a second one munching at the other turtle over there is still working on its first, not even starting to crack it yet. And you'll have a map turtle eat five snails before one of these other ones, the same size gets into one, you know, so that you watch this going on with these next to each other in captivity. Wow. You start to learn things about the wild turtles out there from just watching these, the behavior comparative of these. So, um, I love map turtles. They're really cool. Watch for them. Uh, if any of you have a river nearby uh, and you have binoculars, take binoculars with you. Go up to the shoreline on a sunny day. Find logs or snags sticking out and go ahead and uh, see if you can identify the turtles out there. Okay. Um, so I would say I see there's a map turtle next to the painted that everybody knows. And I tell people on the rivers around here, I probably see 15 to 20 map turtles on the rivers right around where we live. The Red Cedar River is just a few miles from us. Painted turtles, they outnumber the painted turtles 15 or 20 to 1 on the river. Okay, so painted turtles survive on, on rivers, but they're obviously being outcompeted by the super strong uh, swimmer. The, a map turtle in a river habitat. They all compete a map turtle, the painted do. Next one I want to talk about, since we're on rivers, soft shell turtle. My signal up unstable, go away please, thank you. So, uh, like I was mentioning before, kids call it the pancake turtle, the full name is the Eastern Spiny Soft Shell. Now, this, I, here's another name that I'm thinking to myself. Things should be named, as far as I'm concerned, to help the person who's experiencing them identify them. It would be nice. Get this thing going. It wants me to put it down. Those back legs are really going. Mm -hmm. It's trying to push water. The soft shell turtle shell really is, is soft. It is like skin-like. Um, and, it, and because of that, it doesn't have the hard bony uh, shell uh, base like the other turtles. It's lighter for its size. Wow, this thing is really paddling the air. <laughs> I'm clearing my fingers uh, away from its feet and it is really going. Yeah, you're looking right at me now. Here, look at your audience. Hi, oh, a bite now. It just turned around trying to get at my fingers. I'm holding it by the back of the shell. What a long neck. Yeah, so the snapping turtle has a long neck, the, the um, soft shell, and one more. It's opening its mouth, trying to come around. It's had enough of me holding it. But look at that snorkel snout, too. Wow. So the soft shell, by being so light and frisbee-like, thin like this, is able to swim and cut through the water like a frisbee, this thin disc of a turtle. There's very little drag, you know, in the water, and it can really cut through the water. But it's got a disadvantage to having such a light skin-like shell in that anything can bite through this. Have you ever uh, eaten those round raviolis? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> There's the square raviolis, and then there are the round ones. This reminds me of a round ravioli. It's like... This is a ravioli that bites back. So it reminds me of a turtle ravioli. The ravioli turtle. Uh, so some kids say pancake turtle. I'm going with a different uh, human food. I'm going with a ravioli turtle. 
Uh, but anyway, uh, really cool behavior that they have. So you find them on rivers. You also find them on sandy bottom lakes. Uh, they like sand on the bottom of the water because they can burrow into the sand really easily. Think of how easily you could push uh, any disc or like a you know, frisbee right into the sand and make it disappear. Yeah. Not happy. I'll pull this up here. It's kind of going after my finger. Yeah, look at that. Look at his mouth. <laughs> um, yeah, so watch for soft shells. Snapping turtle is the largest turtle in the state. Soft shell turtle is the second largest. A lot of people are surprised to hear that. Out on a river, uh, the Red Cedar River, right in town in Williamston. And here, uh, south of where we live. There are female soft shell turtles out there. They're like 13 inches. Some might even be 14 inches. These are big, big turtles. And uh, the males, again, maybe five inches or so. So uh, common theme there with a lot of these turtles, the female gets substantially larger than the male. I should mention that painted turtle, however, in the snapping, the female doesn't get as markedly larger than the male. They do get larger, but not crazy, like twice as large or anything. Uh, you know what, I'm kind of like looking at it, imagining a painted turtle. You find a painted turtle that is six inches on, on the shell. It's a female. Oh, here's another good thing to mention about the slider that I forgot and the painted. The male on a mature one, the male's front nails get way longer than the back nails, way longer. And so you see super long nails. It only works for the, the uh, mature painted male and the mature slider male, super long. And you look at the back nails. If you're wondering, are these long like Mr. Jim was talking about? Look at them compared to the back nails, and they are way longer than the back nails. You know, you're looking at a male. They use those for courting the female, by the way. Uh, okay. okay. Um, so we covered uh, two of the three that were sitting in their own families. Let's cover the last one. And that is the musk turtle. Now, the musk turtle... I find this kind of humorous as an educator in this area that I hear uh, we're in conversations with people about wild things all the time. This is what we do for a living. And there are certain things that we hear over and over again that people think. And here's one of them. This gets mistaken. Michigan smallest turtle gets mistaken for a snapping turtle all the time. Now, remember I said people know snap. You know, they've heard of a snapping turtle. They see, see snapping turtles. Uh, and they may have never heard of the common musk turtle before. But look, it's the coloration overall is the same as a snapping turtle. They're like the color of mud. And they're that color for a good reason. These turtles, both of them, the musk and the snapping, spend the majority of their time in the mud and muck at the bottom of a pond. They just move around, move around slowly on the bottom, picking at organic material, dead or alive, plant or animal, insects, you know, small fish or whatever, uh, really anything, including plant life some. But these two turtles, and look at this, they're sitting in their own families. These two turtles are not referred to as basking turtles. I'm not going to say they never bask out on a log and dry themselves out, but they rarely do. I have seen some basking musk turtles and some basking snapping. It's not a common activity for them. And because of that, these two turtles get algae building up on their shells because they never dry out. They're not, you know, or they rarely dry out, I should say. And because of that, it lets algae in the water get a foothold on them and start to grow, just like they were a rock underwater or, you know, a plant or a stick that's underwater long enough, all this green, gunky algae grows all over them. And people find adult musk turtles sometimes with, uh, you know, all this green, you know, gunky filamentous algae, almost like a green wig sometimes on them. And you, people see a lot of snapping turtles that way too. So Michigan's smallest turtle, ironically, gets mistaken for biggest la Michigan's largest turtle all the time, but it would be mistaken for a little snapping turtle. 
Look at the size of its tail. <laughs> so, no. <laughs> you remember how long that snapping turtle's dragon tail was? You know, dinosaur tail. And then there are some fine little stripes, light colored stripes, one above and one below the eye on its head. That you know, a lot of times, like on this one, you know, they're not very distinct looking. And so you got to kind of get a close look at this. So these occupy shallow water. They're not very efficient swimmers. Neither is the snapping turtle. Um, and for that reason, both the musk and the snapping spend the majority of their time in water that is shallow enough for whatever size that turtle is. That it has a very short trip to the surface to stick its head or nose out of the water and get get some air, you know, get a gulp of air. Um, you're not going to find a little musk turtle this big in water that's six feet deep. The times that I have seen musk turtles in deep water, I remember one time I'm con uh, kayaking on a lake and I get into this weedy little cove that is thick, thick with water weeds. Maybe some of you can think of a body of water where, you know, you, know, you were boating or kayaking or canoeing and the aquatic vegetation got so thick that you're having a hard time pushing your paddle through it. And one time I was pleasantly surprised sitting there in a super gunky weedy water to see a musk turtle up there near the surface and the tangles of aquatic vegetation were so thick it just climbed up them all the way up near the surface and this thing was moving around through all this thick mats of water weeds getting stuff but it wasn't swimming free swimming in a free column of water it was climbing around on all that thick thick vegetation i thought that was interesting i had never seen it before but i bet you they do it all the time so it's a way that is probably a snapping turtle too, or a musk turtle can get out in deeper water if they have a way to climb to the top. You can drown a little snapping turtle or a little musk turtle by putting it in an aquarium with no way to climb to the surface, put it in an aquarium with deep water and it's glass sides where it can't get a purchase on them. And it has to struggle to get to the surface to get a breath of air. It has to you know, travel so far and then as soon as it gets the breath, it's like, ooh, that was a lot of work. And it sinks back down. And then a few minutes later, it has to get a breath of air, struggling, you know, to the surface, gets a breath, comes down. That thing tires out. It becomes exhausted trying to get oxygen. So, you know, you keep a little one of these in uh, captivity or an aquarium. You make sure that it's in shallow enough water that it can stretch its neck all the way up maybe without even you know having to swim at all stretch its neck all the way up to just stick its nose out of the water without a lot of effort yeah so you know i tell you we learned some of this stuff the hard way you know way back in my early years like oh i accidentally drowned this little snapping turtle so okay so you said so, the musk turtle has its name because it does release from scent glands um, kind of a musky smell when threatened. Do other turtles have that or just the musk yeah, turtle does that? Yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a, a good question. The snapping turtle has it. Mm. So, you know, this is a, probably a good time to mention that um, uh, I call September baby turtle month. The majority of Michigan turtles, the eggs hatch at the end of the summer, maybe late August but through the month of September, depending on, you know, the latitude in Michigan or something. So you are most likely to see a baby turtle or a number of them, like a common one, like a snapping turtle in September, first week of September, Labor Day, something like that, crawling across the road or crawling in the dirt somewhere, crawling across a trail, you know, somewhere where you might be hiking or something. Uh, but you pick one of these little ones up, it very often that thing is upset. It would never try to bite. These little hatchlings have no instinct to bite. It just looks like a little chunk of mud. And you pick this thing up and you're holding it and all of a sudden, phew, what's that smell? <laughs> so they have these little glands like I'm talking about and the musk turtle has it too that they open up when they are upset. Usually that all it takes is being picked up. 
and all of a sudden you're, you're smelling this unpleasant smell. If anybody asks me, what does it smell like? I'm not sure I can say it smells like anything. It's unpleasant though. <laughs> what, however it smells, it's unpleasant. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say it smells like poop or it smells like, you know, I don't know, you know, sweaty socks. I don't know. I, you know, it's got its own unpleasant odor we'll put it that way so hey uh, if i ever had one this is the kind of stuff i do in in schools i've got a little snapping turtle i just found at the beginning of the school year and i bring it into the school and i'm showing it to the kids and i pick that thing up and it starts to smell i want everybody to smell it and i'm going to come around to you saying smell my turtle smell my turtle here turtle Smell it. Smell it. <laughs> Do you think most kids would smell it? Yes. No. Really? Actually, they don't. No, they won't. And I'm like, the smell doesn't hurt. It's unpleasant, but it doesn't hurt. So I'm going around making all these kids go like this with their heads. <laughs> but you have some adventurous ones who will smell it. The teachers, being good sports, usually will smell it. Because <laughs> I want to know. Good sport librarian. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes that'll encourage the kids then. Hey, if Miss Crystal will do it, she survived the smell. Maybe I will too. I challenge okay. all of so, you uh, watching. I challenge all of you watching right now to schedule an appointment to go out to Nature Discovery and report back what it smells like to me. Because I would totally do it. <laughs> Unfortunately, most of the time, these turtles are not scared enough anymore. They know us. We can't like make them smell. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it almost has to be a wild one. But you'll remember this. Hey, you know what? Turtle, baby turtle season is not far okay. away. You know, only a few weeks away. And I would encourage you, you find a little snapping turtle. You know, a lot of you have probably found them before. You pick that thing up and uh, note the odor. The smell, the smell of it. So you you find snapping turtles more often than the musk turtles. So musk turtles inhabit shallow water. They might be on rivers, but I think every time I've seen a musk turtle, it's been on the still water of a lake mm. or a pond. On you shallow water, you know, shallow water habitat. Uh, okay, um, and they're highly nocturnal. You might be more likely to see them early or late in the day. They're active at night. Uh, okay, so you know what I would like to do, uh, Crystal? Um, some of these other turtles we're going to go through now um, are the rarest ones. Now, um, there are, of Michigan's 10 species of turtles, there are four of them that are so rare in the state now, they are protected by law. It's actually by the DNR. They have special protected status. Uh, it's against the law to take these turtles out of the wild. It's against the law to kill one. It's against the law to even have one in your possession, whether you caught it outside or not. Somebody just gave it to you. It is against the law to even have that species in your possession without having a special license or permit from the DNR. So we're going to talk about these four rare turtles to finish up and explain why? What, what factors are making them so rare? What's going on? Okay. And you know what I'm going to tell you is all of them are directly or indirectly people reasons. So I'm going to with protected status in Michigan. So the first one is called the Blandings turtle. You're going to meet that one shortly. Uh, and it's listed as in parentheses special concern. There's different levels of protected status. Uh, everybody's heard of an endangered species. Mm -hmm. Endangered, whether it's at the federal level or the state level, is the biggest trouble. Uh, and they, they have extra laws. You know what? They're really protecting habitat, you know, that these are in as well. The next one is the wood turtle. That's also listed as special concern. Special concern is the, the lowest level of protection. And you know what? That lowest level... Um, basically means the turtle is protected, but they don't have many regulations to protect the habitat, which I find 
disappointing because with nearly all of these, habitat is a huge issue. And so if you have habitat that is being destroyed because somebody wants to build a Walmart or something like that, you know, these special concern turtles, the habitat doesn't come into play and it certainly should, you know. So, and then the third one you see on there is called the Eastern box turtle. That's Michigan's only terrestrial turtle. Terrestrial means land dwelling. They live in forests and uh, their special concern, special concern status. If I was giving them levels of protection, I would make it greater than that. And I know turtle scientists around the state who agree with me they would make it a more critical status to get their, their habitat protected. And then the last one is this cute little one called the spotted turtle. It's black with these bright yellow dots on it. That one is listed as a threatened species, so it has more protection. There's habitat being protected for that one at least. Okay, so uh, we're gonna talk about those. And here are the four main threats to turtle survival. And we're going to talk about each of these four as we're talking about these four last uh, protected turtles. Roadkill is huge. So I'll just mention really quickly, if September we call turtle, uh, baby turtle month, June is turtle egg lane month. So sometimes I call June turtle egg laying month this is when female turtles are coming out all over the place to lay eggs and they're crossing roads, you know, looking for good soil to lay their eggs in in the month of June and they're getting nailed by cars. So I call June two by two different names. I call it turtle egg laying month and I call it turtle roadkill month. Oh, no. I, by far, isn't that sad? I, by far, see more in, in any drivers would who are driving out in country settings. By far, it is not close. See slaughters of turtles on the road in the month of June. And nearly all of them are females that are going to lay eggs or coming back to the water after they found a place to lay eggs and getting hit by cars. So, you know, Crystal, you're looking really sad. <laughs> and you know, I tell, I tell audiences sometimes in my presentations, you were probably coming to have fun learning about turtles and here I go making you all sad. <laughs> sad presentation. But you know what? I care and I want you to care. I want turtles to survive in the world you know, you know our viewers would not be here if you didn't feel the same way everybody needs to learn the turtles and they need to learn the threats because if you want turtles to continue to survive in the world you need to be aware of these things and know what's going on and we can stop it if you know you can stop it if you don't know you know you're gonna, gonna know better enough to stop it okay so look at the next what raccoons we're going to go into detail about that you know hey raccoons aren't people you know how is that what does that have to do with people i'll tell you you'll find out third one is loss of habitat we were talking about that their habitat they need a special habitat and it's getting hard to find those they've been destroyed for whatever reason by people and the last one is illegal collecting people not knowing very simply so many people not knowing they don't know their turtles much less you know to tell one from another much less know that the turtle is um you know a special concern or you know very rare and they might take it home for a pet and they might not even know that oh i just took a rare turtle out of the wild that's against the law so this is why we should all have turtle turtle class you know where you really learn about this in every public school so sometimes i think to myself my educational utopia that if i um could institute in a school a six eight week unit science unit about michigan turtles and you're testing on it and you're meeting all the turtles and understanding everything about them look at this uh pick a grade let's say fifth grade every fifth grader would grow into an adult who knows about turtles 
who knows, you know, oh, watch out, you know, driving around my, my car. It's the month of June. It's turtle egg laying month, you know, uh, and you see a turtle out on the road as a driver and you might be inclined, whoa, and see that it's the rare Blanding's turtle. You might be inclined to pull over to the side of the road and help that thing across the road so the next driver doesn't hit it. So that's the one I want to talk about. Next here is the Blanding's. These get pretty large. Uh, I'll, I'll see a big one sometimes that's over ever over 10 inches on the shell. That's a pretty good sized turtle. This one is about, oh, I'm going to say seven inches maybe right now. Oh, we have fun with the Blanding's turtle. I use this picture a lot in my promotion talking about turtles. The Blanding's picture because when I hold its face up like this, it looks like it's smiling. I have news for you about the, the smiling Blanding's turtle here. Uh, do you see it's kicking in my hands <laughs> just as much as the other turtles? And I would be inclined to ask an audience if you've seen all the rest of them do the same thing. Do you think this turtle is having a good time right now, even though it's smiling? The answer is going to be no. Uh, and, and so turtles, so younger kids, maybe older ones would know this, so maybe younger kids wouldn't. The turtles have very stiff flesh on their faces. They don't have all the soft flesh like we have, where we can make bend the flesh to make all these funny faces or not funny. You know, people look at your face and they can tell that you're happy. They can tell you're sad. They can tell you're surprised. They can tell you're disappointed and so on and so on. They can tell you're puzzled. They can tell you're surprised, whatever. Now with these, I scared you. Sorry, I moved my hand too, too fast in front of it. But since their faces are made up of all stiff flesh, their faces are like a Halloween mask. And whatever look is on that Halloween mask face, no matter how they're feeling underneath the mask, <laughs> that mask is always showing happy. <laughs> So I, I say to sometimes to, you know, like first graders or kindergartners, you know, Halloween, you've got a mask on over your face and it's a big smiling mask. And then you stub your toe or you hurt yourself and you're crying under the mask. That's what like being life like a Blanding's turtle would be like. <laughs> So I cry in front of kids with a smile on my face. We have fun with it. Uh, okay, so do you see the yellow chin? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it, this turtle, like a couple of others we covered, stretches its nose all the way out to here. It has a long, long stretching neck when it really wants to extend there. Yeah, you're starting to see it a little bit. That yellow keeps going all the way down its throat. Uh, a solid yellow. No other Michigan turtle has that. So we're talking about field marks. Okay, here's your best field mark, that bright yellow uh, chin. Interesting plastron, uh, dark markings on the plastron. Interestingly, I've seen some little hatchling Blanding's turtles. And when you look at a hatchling, and these would be hatching in September if you live out in a country setting, uh, and the uh, little hatchlings plastron is totally black. Oh. And then, as they grow, each of these individual scales, see this rectangle? Each of these little scales start to grow and expand. And as they're growing and expanding from this central seam, they're growing out. That initial rectangle of black that used to be solid black of that particular scale gets pushed out and out and as it's growing all of the growing is uh um tissue is yellowish and these little squares that used to be solid black you know when it's when it's little scales rolling this big get keep getting pushed farther and farther out on the rims they're always on the outside rim of the shell and so the, can you picture that? One time when it was smaller, all of these were pushed together, you know, on a little little turtle's body. So that's really interesting. Okay. Hey, I'm going to show you. This one is a male. And I can tell you it's a male by how thick its tail is. Oh. If this was a female, her tail 
would be not quite as long as this, and it would be half the thickness where it's going up into the shell, half of the thickness. Now, do you remember early in our talk, we were talking about um, its tail being part of its body and that the opening for droppings, uh, for making them droppings is on the tail. Well, on a male's tail that's thicker than the female, his opening for the in this opening he uses to attach to the female for mating as well is farther down on the tail away from the body than the female so when I hold him up right here that little bump right there is the opening where it mates and where its droppings come out right next to my fingernail do you see it that little bump right there it looks like a little little slit there Look how far out on its tail it is. If this was a female, her opening is up here. It's still out on the tail, but it's closer to the body. And her tail is skinnier uh, as well. Even though she's holding eggs in there, she manages to squeeze these big eggs out of that little very stretchy opening uh, there. So anyway, let's talk about Blanding's turtles being rare. I love talking about if I'm just showing a few turtles in a presentation, sometimes I'm showing a couple of different Michigan snakes and we have Michigan frogs and stuff in other Michigan wildlife. And I'll do a little sampler presentation. I'll just talk about a couple of turtles, a couple of snakes, a couple of frogs, a couple of butterflies. Talk about because of the four rare Michigan turtles, this is the one you're most likely to run into around here, around the lower of the state. This is the one you're most likely to run into. So I want to talk about that so people can watch for the blandings, right? Yellow chin. So this one doesn't live in any old. Um, are you? Yeah, you're still with me. You were holding so still. I'm like, uh oh. We freeze. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, this turtle doesn't occupy any old body of water. This one loves shallow, weedy water. So there are a lot of wetlands around Michigan that are shallow, weedy water um, that are referred to as vernal ponds or vernal pools. Vernal means spring. In these little low areas in the ground, when the snow melts in the spring, they fill up with water. There might be extra rain in the spring as well. They fill up with water from all of the snow melting and higher ground around that little low spot. And if they fill up with water and um, but by the end of the summer, they start to dry out. You know, warm weather, evaporation and everything. These fertile ponds, usually by August, most of them are shrunk way down. They're really shallow. Some of them dry out altogether. But that is the shallow, weedy habitat that Blanding's turtles like and gravitate to. Now, sometimes I tell people, talking about the vernal pond, you can identify a vernal pond out in the country in the spring, early in the spring, because it is screaming with frogs. <laughs> if I gave a Michigan frogs presentation, I'd be talking about vernal ponds a lot because vernal ponds are great for amphibians, frogs, tadpoles, critical frog nurseries, okay? And so a lot of you, uh, in our uh, video audience, you've probably heard, I'm going to rest it for a while because it's been struggling a long time in my hands, have heard um, um, spring peepers calling on a pond. Early in the spring, late March, early April, they could be deafening. And so I'll tell people, those spring peepers, think of them as sending you two messages. The first message is we are spring peepers and we are making more of ourselves. They're calling because they're mating and egg laying. The second and message loud and clear is this is a vernal pond everybody you know in shrill peeper language and do you think a vernal pond could support fish from what i just told you can fish live in a vernal pond not if it dries up after yeah, they're drying up vernal ponds are drying up on a regular basis i'm not going to say it's impossible to find a vernal pond with fish in it but you're never gonna find bluegills. You're not gonna, don't go fishing in one. You're gonna not have success. Uh, our pond, 
We've been here over 30 years now, just this summer. Found our first fish in the pond. And it's a little fish, only this big, called a mud minnow. And the mud minnow can survive on vernal ponds because when they dry down, you might know where this is going with a name like mud minnow. When the vernal pond dries down, the in fish has an instinct to start burrowing down into the mud, burrowing down farther, 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 farther. And they can make this little, way down deep in the mud, they can make this little, um, almost like cocoon, you know, that has a slimy um, covering around the outside of it. And that ground, around this little, little cell that they made that's going to keep them from drying out. And they just go into this dormant period, just add water, and it gets all wet and mucky again, and they work their way up, and they start swimming in the water again. So uh, that's where I say almost never. Generally, uh, vernal ponds are fish-free ponds. Um, and this is what Blanding's turtles like. So, so turtle poster, there's the blandings. So if I'm not holding the, the live one because it's struggling, I'll just show you this one. See how it's brighter, brighter looking, brighter pattern than the one I was showing you, those colors faded. Okay, so Michigan used to be freckled with vernal ponds, freckled. If a state would have freckles, if you're looking at it from the air, all these little freckly vernal ponds all over the state. Sadly, in the past, let's say 150 years now, one by one, the vernal ponds have been getting drained and filled in. And a lot of it has to do with farmland or building cities and roads and highways and stuff. The state of Michigan has lost three quarters of the vernal ponds that used to be here are gone. Those are frog nurseries. This is the way frogs make more frogs. So for anybody who says, hey, I don't see as many frogs as I used to, well, look, their nurseries for making more of themselves are being taken away. This turtle specializes in the vernal ponds. Scientists studying uh, Blanding's turtles populations have found that where they see the best populations of Blanding's turtles hanging around is where there is a spot where there are a number of vernal ponds over a stretch of, let's say, a half a mile. There's one here, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here. There's a bunch of vernal ponds that are, they call it a complex, fairly close together. And when they radio tag them, so they can put tags, they can put a, some kind of little tag on one of these. And now, you know what? Radio tagging is, is old news. Now it's all GPS tags. And they can put a little GPS tag on this and follow it on a computer everywhere it goes. And they can put these on catch landings turtles in this little area and mark them with these little GPS tags and follow them. Watch on a map, on a computer, everywhere they go. And you know what they find? As the summer goes on and these vernal ponds just start to dry down, some are shallower than others, some dry out earlier than others, that might be a little deeper. These landing turtles are going from one vernal pond to another. And over the course of a year, uh, one Blanding's turtle might visit like four different vernal ponds in that little neighborhood, like a half a mile across. They're going across dry land, finding another pond, living in there for a while. It's drying out, come out, they find another one, and so on. Well, if Michigan has lost three quarters of its vernal pond, I put this before in a school classroom, I put up a big square and I put a bunch of little dots on it or little circles that represent vernal ponds. And then I erase three quarters of them. And then I put lines back and forth like this through the grid and those lines represent roads. Mm. And I say, you're a, you're, a, you're a Blanding's turtle living in this vernal pond right here, this little circle, and it's drying out. And you wanna look for another vernal pond. Back when Michigan was freckled with it, a planting squirrel could leave a vernal pond and go in any direction and find another one before long. And I say to the kids, these days, in most areas, 
What is a Blanding's turtle that leaves a vernal pond more likely to find first? Another vernal pond or a highway? Highway. And all of a sudden we start to understand yeah. And roadkill is huge for Blanding's turtle. So roadkill is a problem for any turtle coming out of the water in the month of June to lay eggs. It is a problem for Blanding's turtles too. But Blanding's turtles have extra opportunities to get roadkill later in the summer by this. Isn't all this interesting, Crystal? I hope you think so. Uh, because I'm fascinated by it and I love looking at the looks on people's faces in an audience as they're learning this. I'm just seeing these little turtle loving light bulbs going out in their heads it's like, wow, I never knew, you know? And I feel good knowing that I may have saved a few Blanding's turtles' lives when a hundred new people just found out about it, you know, what to be careful of, you know. So um, I get depressed often about how so many kinds of wildlife that I love are going down. And this is kind of like my therapy for myself because I see how it affects other people. And, and I know I'm doing my little part, you know, to maybe slow down the decline getting more people to know. Okay, so we covered one and we talked about roadkill. Yes. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is the wood turtle. Well, hello. This is a little side thing between Crystal and I, but she met this wood turtle once before and it pulled its head inside of its shell and it did not want to come out. She never got to see its head. And it usually doesn't do that. I love this turtle. I, you know, I have kids asking me all the time, what's your favorite snake? What's your favorite bird? What's your favorite turtle? And so on. And overall, I say, I don't have a favorite. I like them all. I like the fact that there are all these different kinds. I love the fact that there is diversity. But I think I might have to say that the wood turtle is my favorite Michigan turtle. And I have my reasons. It usually has to do with it. Uh, being unique. Hey, it doesn't have quite a smile on its face, but I want you to see this turtle's face really up close and ask you, does this look like a mean or threatening face or does this look like a benign or friendly face? It looks friendly to me. It's the kind of disposition even a wild wood turtle has. They are super, super gentle turtles. Um, so that's one reason I love it. It has such an innocent look on its face. It almost goes towards a smile, but not like the smile of a Blanding's, but it's such a benign look, totally non-threatening. Uh, do you see the orangey skin on, you know, going into its, between its shells here and on its legs and a little bit on its, on its neck there? That's a good field mark for the, wood turtle. You see there's no stark markings on this turtle. It has mostly black head. There's not really any spotty or stripey stuff going on. Uh, it gets the name. It's a uh, scientific name is called Clemis insculpta. Insculpta, the word that kind of like the root of sculpt or sculpture is in there. And its shell, if you look at some of these segments of its shell, um, they almost look like they are etched. They, they have a, um, it's got a couple of scales ready to shed here, but I don't know that this is showing up so well. Well, you can see it up here a little bit. Yeah. It almost looks like somebody etched in a, like, little patterns into its scales of its shell. So that's unique uh, to the wood turtle. Um, but anyway, a uh, couple of cool things about this turtle. It has... Um, a distinction of being the only Michigan turtle that is capable of eating in the water, underwater, like a, a aquatic turtle, and then coming up on land and eating like the next one we're going to cover, the box turtle. Ooh. A lot of people don't know this. This is just a common aquatic Michigan turtle fact. Aquatic turtles cannot eat out of the water. A lot of people never learn that. They have to have water in their mouth and in their throat, like washing it or sliding it down their throat with water. Okay. And they cannot swallow out of land. For anybody who's 
feeding the turtles outside in the summertime and families can come over and do that by appointment. I'll see some kids, the turtles are swimming around in the water, and, but there's some sitting on the basking rocks as well in the middle of the pool. And kids are dropping turtle food sticks into the water. Turtles are swimming around and eating them. But some kids will go and stick turtle food sticks on the rock by the one that's sitting there on dry land. Uh, and that turtle might be an aquatic turtle like a painted turtle, sees and smells that turtle food stick there. And it'll knows what it is and it'll go and grab it. But as soon as it grabs it, it won't just crunch it up and eats it. As soon as it grabs it, it clump, plunks into the water and eats it. And then it might come back up on the rock to sun itself. But you'll see them right away grab it, must enter the water if I'm going to swallow it. So uh, that's what this one has, this distinction. The only one of Michigan's 10 turtles, it can eat in the water and they live in rivers up north, eat in the water like a aquatic turtle, come up into the woods and feed on land like a land turtle, like a box turtle. Uh, pretty cool. So this one inhabits northern rivers. Uh, it, I'm sure before our state's forests got clear cut, that wood turtles were common in the lower part of the state as well. They've been wiped out of the lower part of the state because of human activities, habitat loss. Uh, on the landscape. So this turtle needs shallow flowing water rivers with forested shorelines, forests on the banks. The rivers down here in this part of the state, there's so much farmland, there's so much cities with long stretches of forest, maybe little patches of forest along their shorelines, but not you know, lots and lots of forest that goes on for miles. You have to go up north to find that now in the state. And so that's where they're hanging on. But sadly, the a uh, um, lot of people don't know this. Do you remember raccoons on that list? I'm going to put this down again because it's struggling a lot. It wants to be put down. And I'll do this. Hold up. There's a wood turtle. This is a very... I, I don't particularly care for this photo because I don't see wild wood turtles with that much orange on them. I wonder if this was kind of color corrected to make it even look more colorful uh, than it like is. A model. Remember I was talking about? <laughs> Pardon? Is it like a oh, model you touched up? <laughs> Yeah, correct. Yeah, the, the, the perfect, the perfect look, so to speak, that in real life you'd never see, you know. But I can hold this up really close and you see that etching I was talking about on this photo. So perfect wood picture here shows that, that etching on its shell really well. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, the wood turtle, I want to talk about raccoons because um, Hold it like this so you can see my face plus the turtle. And um, a lot of people are unaware of this. Back around 1900, it is believed that there were no raccoons in Michigan. The raccoon was a southern mammal. And because of the human presence on the landscape, everybody who knows raccoons has problems with them around their yards or whatever, know that a raccoon is intelligent and very opportunistic. Meaning, you know what, if there is some way that all of a sudden something edible shows up it'll figure out a way to get at it whether it's bird feeders whether it's your garbage or something they're just really really smart and good at going after new stuff that they see in the environment they're good problem solvers and so the raccoon once humans um, are moving into Michigan, they're clearing the forest, they're growing far, you know, crops on farmland and whatnot. We're making life really, really easy for opportunistic raccoons. And the winters were too cold, cold and severe in Michigan without humans there for raccoons to be able to survive this far north. But now, Human presence on the landscape, lots of food, lots of uh, easy pickings for raccoons. So I'll say to kids sometimes, audiences, you know what a raccoon calls a cornfield? All you can eat corn buffet. You know what a raccoon calls a soybean field? All you can eat 
All right, it's limitless. There are hundreds and hundreds of acres in front of it of food. Then it can mix things up with its smorgasbord with your garbage that you put out on the end of the curb. Oh, you know, here, you know, they'll eat anything. Apple core, leftover bread crust, leftover peanut butter and jelly sandwich, whatever, they don't care. They're not picky. And then bird feeders as well. So now we have a raccoon population explosion in Michigan. Raccoons have always had a great sniffing nose. And raccoons, it turns out, are really good at sniffing out newly laid turtle eggs. So Jim Harding is the herpetologist at Michigan State University. Jim Harding is a turtle. He might be the top turtle expert in the state of Michigan. He has dedicated his life to studying the wood turtle in particular. Field guides that he wrote. If you hate anybody, if you want to learn more about Michigan turtles, it's an MSU cooperative extension book, Michigan Turtles and Lizards by James, James H. Harding. <laughs> Okay, and um, this is a very old one that I've had since the 90s when he first put it out, maybe even early 90s. The cover may have changed, I don't know. You can look this up online, MSU Cooperative Extension, just order it. Um, libraries, there are some libraries that certainly are carrying this book as well. Okay, so you wanna learn more about Michigan Turtles? Here's the first one I recommend you get, okay. He also has a book amphibians and reptiles of the Great Lakes region. Same deal. I got this one back in the 90s. However, um, the cover may have changed. There have been a couple of revisions on this and reprints. Okay. Uh, but there's, you know, James Hardy. Okay. Uh, he only lives about 10 minutes from us. I know him really well. I've known him since I was a student at NSU back in the 80s. Okay. And uh, uh, actually, the wood turtle I showed you, I got from him. Oh. So uh, um, he actually may, in another few weeks, be giving me a little wood turtle. Well, anyway, so getting back to um, these wood turtles on the rivers up north, here's what's going on. Wood turtles in the river, female, it's the month of June, maybe mid-late June up north. She has a sleigh. She comes up the bank. She doesn't go up the bank very far. She goes up the bank. She doesn't go all the way into the wood. She might just stop at the top of the bank, dig a hole, lay the eggs, go back into the water. Well, up north in Michigan now, raccoons everywhere. They are everywhere, thick all over the state. And raccoons like to hang around water when they wake up at night. If there's water around, they love hanging around water. They find a lot to eat around the water, okay? And uh, so can you imagine this? The wood turtle lays its eggs during the day, goes back to the water, buries the eggs in the ground, but it has, um, there's a little odor that an animal like a raccoon can smell where those eggs were laid. You or I would walk right by there, and I'm amazed at how well a turtle can replace that, that dirt over where it just laid the eggs. And minutes after it walks away, you can't even tell where it did it. They are really good at making that look totally undisturbed. So by the eye, you're never going to find these eggs. Okay, but the raccoons know, so they come down from the trees, sleeping in the trees uh, once uh, the sun sets. Where do they go up there? They want to go to the water. They come to the river bank. Now, the river might be deep enough in that flowing water. You're not going to get a raccoon swimming across that flowing current. A raccoon's going to be nervous about doing that, but it wants to hang around water water so and all the raccoons do they come down to the shore of the river and you got the river running this way they come down to the shores on both sides they want to hang around the water what do they do they're going up and down the banks the banks of rivers up north have turned into raccoon highways and they're really good at sniffing out eggs and so harding has found that so close to 100% of wood turtle eggs are being eaten by raccoons. You rarely, rarely, rarely see a baby wood turtle on a river anymore. These adults can live up over 50 years. And these females every year are coming up the bank, laying eggs and feeding raccoons. Isn't that sad? Yeah. yeah. Um, and eventually these adults are going to die of old age without leaving any young behind to grow up you know, and uh, make a new generation. 
Another habitat loss issue with them is dams. Remember I said they need shallow water with forested shorelines? When somebody drops a dam in on a river, think of a big wall, the river is flowing. I love seeing this sometimes in museums and stuff. They have simulations of a river. You know, they have flowing water, they hook it up to a tap and they have a simulated situation of a river where you can actually do things to it and see how it would re how it would the water flow would react just like if it was a giant river on a, you know on the landscape uh, which would be uh, so much harder to visualize. So you have water flowing this way a trickling river. You drop a wall in. What happens? Well, the water's flowing that way. It starts backing up, right? It starts backing up here and getting deeper and deeper and deeper. So if the river, the river is the habitat of the wood turtles, they have a linear habitat. They're just going up and down the rivers and using the forest next to the rivers. That's it. So wood turtles go up and down the river. This is how they disperse, up and down the river. And all of a sudden you drop a big wall in there and it fills up with deep, deep water. All the forest around it gets flooded and all of a sudden there's a gigantic lake that they call a reservoir. That's not wood turtle habitat. They just destroyed that wood turtle habitat. You have to go way upstream to find it skinny again. And then that wall, and that giant reservoir doesn't allow wood turtles to disperse up and down the river. You just put a wall in and now there's a population here and a population here. These wood turtles will never meet these wood turtles again, ever again in the future because there's a big wall separating them. You can find rivers up north where there's a big dam. You go another five miles down the river, boom, another dam. You go another five miles down the river, boom, another dam. And you have these little trapped populations of wood turtles between the dams. And there's deep water here in a tiny little remnant of habitat for wood turtles there. And there's no other wood turtles coming into the population. And next thing you know, you have brothers and sisters mating with each other, inbreeding and stuff going on and that little wood turtle population is just going to die out yeah. yeah all right so moving on another sad thing i want these to survive they're still around there's still time uh so it's never too late sometimes i meet people who say things are in such bad shape with us losing why wildness and wild things and stuff like that and i tell them you know what don't give up you can't give up because if people generations from now could look back and see you saying and it's extinct the animal is extinct 100 years from now and they found out that you got apathetic oh they're goners they're still there but there's no hope for them you know because we can't stop people or something they would not be happy with you that there it was it still had a chance right and you decided it's too late. It's never too late. Never as too long late. as we're living individuals, it's never too late. So we have to be hopeful. Okay, the next one I want to talk about is the, the box turtle. So we were mentioning land turtle. Look, it has a really high dome shell. Yeah. Some people look at that and think it's a tortoise because it has such a high dome shell. Tortoises have a high dome, but we don't have any wild tortoises in Michigan. This is a young one, but your, your, your basic box turtle can get maybe yeah, maybe five or six inches. So six inches would be a really big one. Maybe five, four to five inches long on the on the shell. Okay. And do you see that pretty pattern on it? You know what this pattern does? So, you know, Crystal, you asked me before with the other turtles, hey, you know what, how does that, those markings serve its the purpose with it? You know what? This one lives on the forest floor. There are leaves, a canopy with sun shining through the canopy in little dappled sunshine. Dappled means little scattered spots of sunshine on a brown background that's dead leaves and dirt on the forest floor. This turtle's shell mimics dappled sunshine on a forest floor. And when you're walking through the woods, 
And there is a, let's say there is a box turtle. You don't know it's there, but it's in full sight, plain sight, only 10 feet off the trail in plain sight, sitting there in the leaves. And it sees large mammal hiker coming down the trail. It might have been moving around, going after worms and, you know, leaves and insects and stuff like that. But all of a sudden it sees, oh, large creature approaching. What does it do? It doesn't run and hide. It just stops. Just stops. That's all it has to do is stop. And you're going to go walk right by that thing. It could only be just, you know, a, 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 a jump off of the trail. And it stays perfectly still, dappled sunshine of the forest floor. Your eye will pass right over it, not knowing it's there. So um, terrific camouflage for it. I want to tell you, over the years, keeping box turtles, and wanting to give them exercise outside and letting them wander around. Hey, it's a turtle. They don't move very fast, but you can get complacent about it. And we have had these box turtles disappear on us. We've lost a few over the years. Sometimes you're out there letting it crawl around and take your eye off of it for just three minutes, no more than three minutes. And all of a sudden, you're like, where'd it go? Where'd it go? Where could it possibly have gone? It's a turtle in three minutes. And you're searching and searching and searching. And all of a sudden, you find it. Your eye is on it. And it's right there. It's right there out in the open, only like 30 feet from you. And now we're in work. Things hold still. It's crazy how difficult it is to put your eye on them, even when you know they're there. Yeah. And they're good diggers too. They can, you know, they can burrow down into leaves or into soft soil, disappear really easily. That's how they spend the winter. That's all they do. Uh, when they're feeling too hot or too cold, they just burrow. The soil, if it's too hot, the soil is cooler. If it's too cold, the soil is a little bit warmer, not as, um, as stark. Okay, so that's an omnivore living in forests in the lower peninsula of Michigan. They have declined largely to habitat loss, foresting cut down. Raccoons always. Jim Harding told me, I don't know that I ever read this in print, but Jim Tar Harding has told me more than once in conversations that he is sure that well over half of all turtle eggs, no matter what species it is, get devoured by raccoons every year. More than half, no matter what species it is. Wood turtles, especially bad. But box turtles, you know, more than half of them getting eaten by raccoons and stuff. So they're laying eggs in the woods, digging a hole, same way, uh, and laying the eggs. And uh, um, uh, so raccoons are the problem, yes. Habitat loss, just forced being cut down. You know, you don't find many box turtles in the bottom few counties alone. Or in so Michigan, just because of all the farmland and all the, you know, all the all the development, urbanization, and whatnot, habitat is gone. And then the third thing coming in is illegal collecting. Or fourth, that's all of them. Yeah. Illegal collecting. Can you see somebody walking through the woods? They come across this cute little box turtle crawling, and they pick it up. Oh, what a cute turtle! I want to take it home for a pet. And it's illegal to do that. It is state protected against the law to take them out of the wild, kill them, possess them. We're possessing one, but we have this special permit. And they're only going to give you a permit if you are an educator. There is no reason, other reason they give you a permit. And not only that, the permit will not give you permission to take one out of the wild in Michigan. You have to get one some other way. Now, there are a lot of box turtle populations down south. But in the state of Michigan, you cannot take one of these out of the wild. We got this from somebody who was using them uh, educationally for years that had his own permits mm -hmm. from the DNR, and he was retiring. Okay. And he contacted us and asked us if we wanted them. I'm like, sure, we would love them. So we have, we have a couple of those. Okay, and then, uh, so... That's an example of illegal collecting where somebody might not know any better. Well, everybody would know better if this was a class in fifth grade, all public schools, right? Uh, so this is my argument. Hey, any uh, 
school district supervisors out there who are listening, contact me. <laughs> or teachers who might think they would like a program like this in the class that goes more than just a quicky little presentation. Uh, okay, I'm down to my last turtle, believe it or not. <laughs> All right, so uh, last one I have to show you is Michigan's rarest turtle, and that is, oh, yeah, <laughs> the one that looks like Crystal's blouse. I don't know if you have a, a dress or a blouse on. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, so look at that. This, uh, the uh, spotted turtle, appropriately named, is black with all of these fine, perfectly round yellow spots all over it. Now, this one right here is a young female. Musk turtle is Michigan's smallest turtle. Right behind it is the little spotted turtle. Spotted turtle occupies a very um, specific wetland habitat that there are not a lot of. In Michigan, it's called a fen. In a fen, is mostly grassy, there's open sky. So you're, if you walk into a woodsy area that's all, and, the, and the ground is wet, that can't be a fen. A fen is all mostly grasses and sedges, wide open sunshine. There might be some scattered bushes and shrubs around in there, but you're not gonna have trees and shade, okay? And it's extensive. There are a lot of fens associated with river floodplains where the river might flood in the spring just about every year and the bank doesn't go up like this. It's very flat and the river overflows its banks and just fills these plains on both sides of the uh, river that allows all these uh, aquatic grasses and, uh, and sedges to grow up in, in thick amounts. And the Water might be shallow, just a foot or two at the most, deep for a while in the spring, and that slowly dries down then. And these uh, spotted turtles are swimming around, living in the shallow water, and there are these clumps of grass that stick up. They're called hummocks that might stick up out of the ground. They're just balls of roots of grass. And when they die back, there's a little bit more material. Then they grow up the next year and die back, and there's a little more material. They're called hummocks that grow up. And these turtles will come up out of the muddy water and sun themselves on these little hummocks. But if anybody wanted to, who knew that this is special habitat, where these spotted turtles live, live, and this is the only type of habitat they live in. You won't find them in a little vernal pond. Why? They need extensive fen habitat that goes on and on, you know, along the side of this river that stretches out in there. You know, there might be tens or hundreds of acres. A little vernal pond is only an acre or two on average in size or so, so that's what they need. But somebody who knows that this rare, rare Michigan turtle is out there. And if they wanted to, and protected, wanted to go out there and try to catch some, the water is shallow. And that water is so shallow that if you want to go out after a painted turtle on the water and you see that it's sunning itself on a log that's sticking up out of the water and you try to swim or you're never going to get it swimming, you know, come up to it with your canoe or kayak or your rowboat or something like that, that thing's going to turn and see you coming and the map turtle would be the same way. Jump in the water and look at all the deep water. It just disappears in seconds under the water and it's safe from you coming after it. These little turtles, since they live in such shallow water, this thing sees you coming if you're wading through that and it's sunning itself on one of these little hummocks and it jumps into the water. It can only go this far. So they're going to be easier to catch for somebody who knows about them and what they're doing. And here's what's really sad. You're not going to have somebody illegal collecting. You're not going to have somebody like a family walking through the woods who doesn't know any better, who finds a box turtle and says, oh, what a cute turtle. Let's take it home for a pet. I am sorry to say there is an illegal pet uh, black market on spotted turtles. How sad. There are people who are cleaning these out from like protected habitat. It is specially protected. There's other rare things in the fen habitat. The fen habitat, there's a lot of that that just doesn't exist anymore. And you find rare plants in these habitats and all kinds of unusual wild things. 
you know, in addition to the spotted turtle. And there are, there are people going out there who know that if they catch one of these, it is such a rare turtle that there are wealthy people who want to have things that nobody else can have, who will spend a ridiculous amount of money to have their own spotted turtle and they catch people smuggling. That means illegally leaving the country, smuggling spotted turtles out of the country to try to take them to Europe or Asia or other countries where they can sell them to rich people and they can make a lot of money. I, it breaks my heart you know, that people could be that selfish that they will make this species disappear in the wild just so that they can make more money and they don't care about that. And so, you know what, it's going to be harder for people to do things like that if everybody knew they were doing it. You remember the four, everybody? Habitat loss, illegal collecting, raccoons, yeah. and, then and what was the last one? Roadkill. Roadkill, you got it. You got all of them. All right. So uh, these are, you know, you learned about uh, all 10 species of Michigan turtles now. You learned about the rare ones. You learned about troubles they're having uh, surviving. You learned about a number of their interesting behaviors. Um, you learned about habitat and their range through the state. We covered a lot. We did. We did. So, so uh, anyway, I'm going to, yes, believe it or not, stop talking. And uh, Crystal, I don't know if you had any questions or anything before we sign off that um, you would like to discuss before we say our goodbyes? Well, I don't think I have any more questions. We answered all of the questions of our library patrons and you answered you know, the questions I had throughout. Um, I wanna let everyone know that this video will be on our YouTube channel. So you can see below, um, in the box below, the website for Nature Discovery and the Facebook page for Nature Discovery. If you're interested in taking your family out to see these animals live and in person, you can make an appointment with Mr. Jim to visit them and see the turtles. Maybe you see the snakes that we had in our last program with Mr. Jim and a variety of other Michigan wildlife. Um, and also, if you have more questions, he would be happy to answer them. You can reach him on the Facebook page by sending a message to them. Um, right. And also, and our, our, uh, our website has our email address. So email or message, Facebook message us. And we'll usually get back to you within 24 hours, same day or within, within by the next day. Great. Um, I also want to remind you that if you want to read more about turtles, we have a variety of books at the library, and you can put them on hold and pick them up curbside right now. Um, so, and this video will stay up for a long time, so you can refer back to it anytime you want. And I think that's everything I have to tell our friends. All right, so my parting words are be nice to turtles, learn about turtles. This might be most important of all, be the teacher. You learned a lot about turtles today. Share this information and your concerns, your concerns, like I shared my concerns, now they're your concerns, I put them on you, and share what you learned with other people. Um, I think that's so important. Yes, wonderful. Okay, thanks, Mr. Jim, for joining us today. And All right, thanks for having me. That was fun. <laughs> Have a great day, everyone. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.